From this land of contrasts, a very good welcome to you. Night has long fallen on French Guiana. It's 20 past 8 here in the evening at the European Spaceport, and we're 26 minutes away from the launch of another Ariane, this time carrying Echo Star 2. Let's introduce ourselves. I'm Martin Ransom, and with me is Sune Abramson. Good evening. Good evening, Sune. And you, Sune, are our technical consultant from Ariane Space. In fact, you've been directly involved with this flight. Yes, specifically for this flight as deputy to the payload manager, Michele Franchi, and we'll be seeing him later on. We're speaking to you from the Jupiter Mission Control, situated some 15 kilometers from the launch zone. And out there on the pad, we saw her just a moment ago, and we'll be seeing her again, the star of our show, our Ariane launch vehicle, an Ariane 4 with a special configuration. It is a 42P, and it's flight uh, 91, and it's ninth of this year. 42P will be explaining that graphically in a moment. For the moment, our countdown clock you see in the right-hand top corner, 24 minutes and counting, ticking away nicely. It's just one of the things displayed here. And it is the, uh, you saw the green panels, and uh, talking about the various subjects like uh, launcher and the base and so on. We'll talk more about it later. Let's see now a description of our mission from the Guiana spaceport with its wide launch arc, able to shoot into geostationary orbit and polar orbit as well. We have uh, a window that is one hour and 52 minutes long. We're aiming to lift off at 47 minutes past the hour. We're being beamed to the United States. Hi there to, to people in uh, Denver, especially. Our configuration now, Sune? It is the 42P with the first stage. It's 240 tons heavy. It has two solid boosters, uh, weighing 25 tons together, actually. Uh, the second stage, and I give you the mass here as well, about 40 tons fully fueled. And the cryogenic stage, the third stage, H10-3, of 13 tons. We have a VB, just 600 kilograms, and the fairing enclosing the satellite, which gives another 700 kilos to the total mass. And our precious baby is hidden under that fairing, Echo Star 2, weighing in at just over 6,300 pounds. Echo Star 2, based on the Series 7000 platform from the stables of Lockheed Martin Astra Space. All is green on those status panels, go for liftoff. We have the operationals here in Jupiter, all behind the glass panels, looking at those status panels and their consoles. We also have uh, many guests who've come here specially for this flight. And there we have Mr. Francis Avanzi. Yeah, he is the uh, Aerospace Director General, Chief Operating Officer, and he's heading up the flight direction. In 1980, as the first industrial and commercial space transportation company in the world, Ariane Space operates the Ariane launch system developed by the French space agency CNES on behalf of the European space agency ESA. Ariane Space demonstrates European scientific and technical capabilities and has the backing of the space industry and banks of 13 countries. Ariane Space operates worldwide with its European headquarters at Evry just outside Paris in France a subsidiary in Washington, D.C. in the USA, a branch office in the Asia-Pacific zone located in Tokyo in Japan, and a launch complex in Kourou, French Guiana, with a unique geographical position close to the equator. Combined with the extremely accurate orbit injection of Ariane, this equatorial position extends the life of the satellites. Constantly adjusting to changes in international market demand, Ariane Space provides customers with a complete, personalized range of launch services based on extensive experience and a highly reliable vehicle which can place payloads of up to 4.8 metric tons with Ariane 4 and in the near future 7 tons with Ariane 5 directly into orbit. Ariane Space is engaged in a long-term production program with its European space industry partners. The manufacturing, which follows a tight quality policy, is permanently aimed at meeting customer requirements worldwide. Twelve thousand highly qualified Europeans are engaged in this manufacturing activity. The success of this venture is largely due to the power and cohesion of the industrial partners involved, 
The principal contractors are Aerospatial, SEP, Daza, the Fiat Group, Matra Marconi Space, Casa, Berlicon Contraves. The various launcher sub-assemblies are built in Europe and taken by sea, air and land to the Kourou spaceport. Ariane Space, very happy to have been able to satisfy tonight's customer so quickly since uh, early spring. April the 29th, the contract was signed in Denver by Mr. Avanzi and Mr. Charlie Ergen, who we'll be seeing later on. Some of our guests, there's the, uh, our real guest, every, uh, welcoming everybody, Mr. Michel Mignot, who is the uh, director of the base. Let's now review the campaign, the preparation of our launcher. Booster assemblies are manufactured in Europe and shipped together on one of the two specially dedicated ferries just in time for the start of the launch preparation campaign on August 3rd. The first two weeks, for a total of 13 working days, are carried out in the preparation area, where the three propulsive stages and the electronics bay are put together. On August 26th, the empty vehicle is gently towed to the launch pad. After closing in of the cryogenic arms, used for liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen loading during the final chronology, the gantry is pulled forward, isolating the vehicle from the outside environment and giving access to the different levels for the remaining two weeks of preparation. Specific to this version of the vehicle, the side rocket boosters are added on the pad for safety concerns. Five days before the chronology, the encapsulated payload is brought up to the tower and mated to the booster. T-minus 18 minutes and some 30 seconds, all is still green on the status panels, ready for liftoff. With proceedings today, Sune being watched by a fair number of children. It's quite uh, nice to see so many youngsters here. It's interesting, I think there are at least uh, nine of uh, the Charlie Ergen family here in the one of the front rows. And uh, Mr. Ergen's uh, business is very much a family affair. Let's now review Echo Star Corporation. In the beginning, there was a vision. A dish in every home. The year was 1980, when Echo Sphere Corporation was founded. Under the brand name Echo Star, we quickly established ourselves as a leader in the satellite industry. To date, EchoStar has delivered over 2 million C-band systems worldwide. EchoStar has earned and maintains the reputation as a company dedicated to providing customers with the finest equipment, systems, and service available. We have long been industry leaders who have achieved many milestones. The first company to offer an integrated receiver to scrambling the first to develop a UHF universal remote control, the first third-party programming packager, the first to solely establish a satellite installation network, and the first to offer an in-house consumer financing program. Now, EchoStar is growing with the latest technology, the emerging 18-inch direct broadcast satellite TV industry. EchoStar offers the most technologically advanced product and services at the lowest price in the marketplace. To make this happen, in 1987, Echo Star applied to the FCC for a DBS license. Four years later, we were granted a license to construct, launch, and operate a DBS satellite. Shortly after, Lockheed Martin began work on our first two satellites. To aid in broadcast operations, a state-of-the-art worldwide digital broadcast center was built in Cheyenne, Wyoming. This 60,000 square foot facility is one of only a few facilities in the world with the ability to transmit and receive digital audio, video, and high-speed data signals from around the world. It also features digital edit suites, functional studios, and related broadcast equipment, an uplink truck, plus more. 
The geosynchronous position at 119 degrees west longitude for Echo Star 1 and 2 is one of only three FCC-approved high-powered satellite locations that cover the entire continental United States. The successful launch of Echo Star 1 brought us the ability to begin a new era in digital television delivery with Dish Network, America's most popular channels and services at the lowest prices available from a single source, Echo Star. Dish Network has proven to be a hot commodity. In fact, Dish Network reached 100,000 subscribers in a shorter time since our rocket launch than any other direct broadcast company. Our worldwide digital broadcast center gives us great flexibility, capacity to grow, and the ability to stay at the forefront in the satellite TV industry. And the launch of Echo Star 2 gives us the ability to increase our services with up to 200 channels of programming, audio channels, pay-per-view services, business TV, and data information available. There are many more milestones ahead of us. Beyond Dish Network, we're already taking steps to make Echo Star the leader in providing additional satellite-related services. We plan to complement our existing DBS service with local and regional programming and additional business services like internet access, data gathering, distance learning, software distribution, medical and technical teleimaging, video conferencing, messaging, and telecommuting possibilities, to name a few. Look to EchoStar to remain at the forefront of the digital revolution, helping people understand how to make satellite technology work for them. And look for great things from Dish Network, because our goal still remains to place a satellite dish in every home, school, and business throughout the world. With all we have to offer, it's clear why we say nothing else compares. Echo Star and Echo Sphere and the various companies have taught HBO something about dealers, commissions, and I hope along the way we've taught them a little bit about programming. So congratulations, good luck, and we look forward to the next 10 years. I'm Lou Dobbs of CNN. Congratulations and best wishes to Echo Star on a successful launch. Hi, I'm Brad Siegel, president of TNT and Turner Classic Movies. Congratulations to all our friends at Echo Star on your successful launch. Congratulations again to Echo Star for all of your recent accomplishments and good luck. On it. For more information on Dish Network, call 1-800-333-DISH. And we should say a very good evening to all our viewers on the DISH Network who are watching this video transmission from Kourou, French Guiana. T-minus uh, 12 minutes and 50 seconds. What is the weather like for this launch, Sunny? We have uh, almost perfect weather. We are waiting for the next report in a couple of minutes, but not expecting any changes. No rain, clear sky, so it will be nice for those at the site. Let's now review the satellite preparation reviewed for us by John Argesinger. Echo Star 2 arrived in Cayenne on the 17th of July. After transport to the Space Center, the satellite was mated to the flight adapter as a final check of the mechanical and electrical interfaces. The spacecraft then successfully passed its electrical test and went into storage on July 29th. On August 14th, the spacecraft was moved to the launch area for fueling by the men in scape suits. Was mated with the several adapters. And then we said farewell as Echo Star 2 was carefully enclosed in the fairing. The application of the Echo Star logo was the final step before transport to the launch pad. Good luck, Echo Star 2. John Argesinger there, Satellite Mission Director. T minus uh, 11 minutes. Uh, what's happening at this moment on the pad as we see our launcher? 
We have fueled the third stage and we're topping up and uh, actually having a margin waiting for the uh, uh, synchronized sequence. We have another key figure, Suni, in this uh, flight. He's the launch operations manager. Who is he? That's uh, Francis Pellacur. He's in charge of the launch vehicle operations and he's at the uh, launch vehicle's control center about uh, 10 miles from here. And he's about a kilometer from the actual launch pad. There we see members of the Ergen family, Mr. and Mrs. Ergen. Let's now uh, review the uh, flight as seen by Mr. Rohan Zaveri, program manager. Interviewed by Michele Franchi. Okay, so Rohan, thank you for taking the time to spend a couple of minutes with us. I know you are quite busy with the preparation of the launch, which is just a couple of days away. You've been managing the procurement of uh, the spacecraft. Uh, this is the second uh, EcoStar is procuring, but it's an all new experience for you uh, and your company. So tell us something more about it. That's true. It's been a, uh, a new experience for us, but we are uh, managing uh, accordingly. It's been a interesting uh, venture both with the satellite company and the launch company and we hope to as we go into the more of our launches get more experience and, uh, just keep me on my toes if i can say that so uh, when is this second uh, space is going to add uh, to the first one um, as i already have mentioned uh, about the dvs boards we hope to provide more with this satellite in terms of programming that is additional capacity in terms of pay-per-view uh, additional niche places of international sports, that type of stuff. So the U.S. market in terms of the uh, U.S. broadcast satellite like routine and sports. Mm -hmm. uh, that's uh, the main goal for the settlement. Okay. So you're now with uh, spacecraft number two. Yes. And what are the plans for the future? Plans for the future already are, have been made, and we already have plans for spacecraft number three, four, and five that will uh, increase our uh, offerings to our residential and business customers. These uh, plans will be more specialized in terms of local or regional types of services and will complement the dish network. So Ron, just one last question before we say goodbye. It has been your first experience in Vienna. How do you feel? I feel great, Nikita. Your service and hospitality by Aaron Space has been wonderful. And I'd like to give you a saying that we have an FSR, nothing else can tell us. Uh, you're very nice, Rohan. Thanks very much for the compliments. Getting closer to liftoff, eight minutes away, uh, we had shots there of the service gantry, which until five hours ago was uh, sheltering our launch vehicle for these final operations for these past few days, Sunni. What uh, was taking place uh, there? Yeah, first of all, uh, yesterday we fueled the first and uh, second stages with storable fuels. It takes uh, uh, more than uh, a usual day of uh, eight hours work. And uh, this morning early, we started taking away all the platforms in the gantry. And uh, you'll see here the gantry, which is a 3,000 ton construction being moved away slowly. It takes about 45 minutes, actually. I believe it's the biggest metallic mobile structure ever built by European industry. Yeah, and in Europe, as you know, we're in Europe here. It uh, crawls back some uh, 80 meters, is it, from the uh, launch pad? That is correct. And uh, there, for the first time, you see out in daylight the whole launcher with its payload on. As you saw earlier uh, at the rollout, uh, it was no payload on. It's one of the first things that uh, visitors, when they come for a flight, they go out and see the rollback. It's the uh, first appearance of the star of our show. Ariane with the fairing and under that fairing our precious passenger. Everything is still green on the status panel, seven minutes and counting, seven minutes precisely. We're coming up to uh, an important uh, step, the six minute mark. Uh, that is the start of the synchronized sequence. We have uh, at the top of the launcher the cryotechnic arms which you will see at uh, the seconds before uh, the ignition. You have here a composed picture of the two arms, hydrogen on the, the right and oxygen on the left, uh, uh, the carrying the fluids, supercooled fluids into the third stage. Right, uh, DDO, our launch range manager, about to announce the six minute mark, the start of the synchronized sequence.
stop moins 6 minutes début de la séquence synchronisée. Julio Montréal est le manager de long range aujourd'hui. Il est de la Agence Space Agency CNES. What better way to explain what happens during this sequence than to talk to the launch operations manager, Francis Pellacker, and we took our cameras into his control center earlier today. We're here in the CDL, which means the launch control center, really the Ariane launch control center. We're in a bunker. Uh, there's no other word for it because the building is well protected with very thick concrete walls. We're in the final stages of the chronology and the synchronized sequence during which the computers automatically trigger a certain number of operations. For example, concerning the electrical aspects, we'll have the start of the first stage servo motors, the switch from external to onboard power, the arming of the launcher, and of course the start of the flight program. On the mechanical side, the launcher will be isolated from the ground installations, there will be the pressurization to flight level of the third stage, and gradually will arrive at T minus five seconds. seconds. A réduit des comptes suite à un rouge lanceur. So at uh, uh, T minus five seconds, the first stage engines will be ignited at twice the size T zero. And if everything goes well, we will lift off at T plus four point six seconds after the pressure of the first stage engine has been checked. Everyone is at his console, very attentive, watching that what we call the key moments to see that everything is proceeding well, step by step through this automatic sequence. The atmosphere is serene, and I must say everyone is very calm between T minus six minutes and liftoff. One feels that everyone is fully occupied, nevertheless, one can sense to everybody a heartbeat is accelerating. Right, uh, Francis Pellacker's heartbeat must have risen because we have a red on the status panels, a red concerning the uh, launch, uh, the launcher itself, uh, Sune. So the clocks have stopped and uh, stopped at the six minute mark. And also the uh, total launch uh, facility. facility is red for the time being. Right, now when we have uh, um, a halt in the chronology, first of all we should explain, as we mentioned earlier, we do have a, a, a window to launch which is one hour and 52 minutes long, so there is no hurry to find out uh, what is the anomaly. Uh, if uh, we find the, uh, as we hope to find, the reason of this anomaly, we will we'll start the chronology back again at the minus six minute mark. But first, uh, Suni, you can explain uh, the inquiries into what is happening, uh, what uh, has triggered this red uh, on the uh, status panel. Uh, that analysis is taking place at the launch control center? It is immediately uh, starting at the launch control center. Uh, we have yet no information of what could have happened. Uh, immediately. Le rouge compte rendu de ouverture d'un clapet trop tardive. So we've just got information that it's uh, uh, slightly delayed opening of uh, the hydrogen uh, hydrogen valve and uh, uh, people are going to look into this and uh, uh, propose and decide on corrective actions and uh, as you said we'll restart at uh, the uh, six minutes which is where we have the normal launch configuration back again. Uh, the system is so designed that the system can, uh, the chronology can start uh, practically immediately the anomaly has been rectified. And I understand that uh, we probably uh, will be able to start the chronology again fairly rapidly. In this case, in this case we had uh, read very early in the, the uh, synchronized sequence and it's much easier at that point in time to get the launcher back into configuration and the news have just arrived that in about 10 minutes we will be ready to start again. 
What is happening whilst the launcher is waiting uh, on the pad? Uh, everything is absolutely safe and secure during this wait? Uh, definitely. Uh, on a routine matter, we're getting the launcher back into pre-synchronized sequence condition, verifying that the topping up is continuing uh, in the, the correct fashion. Uh, the, uh, in this case, uh, looking at what have happened to that we got the wrong signal from the valve, uh, ensuring that uh, the next try we will have the right signals and uh, start again. We have at the launch control center uh, monitoring this, this synchronized sequence and triggering all the different actions. We have two computers and it's perhaps because of this uh, considerable computing power that we're able to analyze the situation so rapidly and get to the uh, bottom of any problem. Yeah, yes, actually, the, there are two computers working in parallel, uh, checking out the launcher and uh, giving the orders, uh, commanding the various valves, uh, the various activities needed to finally launch. Uh, there are narrow limits on each of uh, these commands, verification that all parameters are all right. Uh, it may happen that uh, uh, the return of uh, uh, the confirmation that an order had been executed is not coming in the right way. And of course, everything stops immediately as it's a, uh, it shows up as a malfunction. We saw the cryotechnic arms earlier. They, I presume, are continuing to top up uh, the third stage so that it remains uh, brimful? That is correct. We're getting back into the just prior to six-minute launch configuration. What about the uh, tracking installations and uh, all the people who are going to be monitoring the flight once we lift off? Are they on hold as well? They are on hold as well, and that is the same with respect to the satellite. Maybe we should talk about uh, we haven't come to that stage yet, but normally the satellite should be on internal power a bit uh, uh, later, about three minutes, three and a half minutes before. Often the satellites go on internal power earlier. Uh, in this case, when there is only a 10 minute hold approximately, they would probably stay on internal power. Rohan Zaveri there checking the situation, presumably with regard to the health of his satellite. It's as it waits, as you say, it's uh, probably not yet on its uh, internal power batteries. Mr. Avanzi behind him, waiting quite patiently. There's nothing else one can do until uh, the problem is fixed and we get the green light to go ahead. So we are happy here. We have to talk about it for the time being and, and uh, explaining to people. But uh, many are waiting here, as you can see from uh, the EcoStar responsible people. Mr. Zhang there, I believe he's in charge of uh, business development at Echo Star Corporation. That is correct. This is a fairly, uh, I wouldn't say normal occurrence, but every launch does have its little uh, unscheduled surprises that uh, hope, hopefully and very frequently are solved quite rapidly. There we see Mr. David Baer from Lockheed Martin. And Lockheed Martin is the uh, manufacturer of the satellite. He is from uh, East Windsor in New Jersey. He is the uh, Echo Star Satellite Program Manager. And I believe that uh, on the uh, left-hand side of the screen, uh, with the earphones, we have Mr. Erwin Muller. He is uh, one of uh, the space business's pioneers in that he helped launch the very first Telstar satellite going back some years ago. Mentioning Telstar, we have a platform from uh, Lockheed Martin, the Series 7000 platform. Arian Space has uh, already launched uh, this platform on oh, other, just, other uh, clients. Uh, yes, just for uh, these two gentlemen we saw here, it's. Uh, Erwin Muller and uh, John Augersinger as well, which are technical support to EcoStar, and they uh, 
John has been here every September for the last three years, I think, for Telstar uh, tell 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 launches. This is the scene then as we wait for a green light to uh, proceed with this liftoff uh, chronology. The scene inside Jupiter 2, the building that was inaugurated earlier this year and uh, which has these facilities to welcome uh, the guests of our clients. A very impressive building, very well designed so that people can, uh, if they so wish, and they normally do, go out on the terraces to see the lift off with their own eyes. It's also the first time I'm doing a commentary from this building, which is interesting. Uh, the uh, uh, setup is totally different from the old one. Because you're an old hand. Ah, there we have the uh, Zimmer family, Scott Zimmer with his children saying hello to people back in Englewood, uh, Colorado. No doubt to their school kids, very fortunate kids who've been able to see uh, the, this launch. And uh, Katie, the elder, eldest child of the Ergen family, was telling me how she tells all her schoolmates about these launches and shares her experience. And uh, I've just seen that uh, the launcher is no longer red. So the problem with the launcher has uh, now been cleared up and we're just waiting for the base to catch up and uh, get ready in the launch configuration. Here's a nighttime scene, cameras on the hilltop above the uh, technical center of the European spaceport with the entry all lit up. Our status panels uh, practically all green. We just are waiting for confirmation that we can go ahead with the chronology. Generally when you have a launch in red and then the launch uh, control center and launch base also goes on red as it's getting out of the configuration and now we have to uh, come back into launch configuration and it will take some more minutes. Here's an interesting shot where uh, we often are asked what are those flames behind the launcher? Yeah, the, it's not the launcher burning, that's uh, hopefully, correct. Hopefully. Uh, as you know, the cryogenic fuels are very volatile and they are off-gassing. And to keep the... Mr. Ergen and his family saying hello to their friends as well. <laughs> the, this is out-gassing behind the launcher? Uh, the or, yeah, out of the tanks from the hydrogen and the oxygen side. You can easily let the oxygen out because you can breathe it and so on. But hydrogen together with oxygen is a bit nasty if you uh, don't control it. So we're putting the hydrogen through water and when it bubbles up we uh, light it up and it burns off in that way, in a safe position. Right, our director who's got his cameras up on this hilltop above the technical center has just told us that in fact uh, if we look very carefully on the left-hand side, below the uh, red sign that says Ensemble de Lancement, oh, it's disappeared. There's a little white dot, which in fact was our Ariane 4 all lit up on its pad. And that is, as we said earlier, some 15 kilometers from this technical center and the Jupiter building. The teams here, um, we see uh, Julio Montréal, the DDO, and we see Didier Cassé. Right, an imminent uh, restart. restart of the chronology, and we will start again at minus six minutes. Correct. Retour au vert de l'ensemble de lancement et début de la séquence synchronisée. Top. Right, we're back in. LH0, 0 heure, 0 minute. 59 seconds. Right. Uh, we're back into the synchronized sequence, and now if we can passively uh, explain a few more details about what happens during the synchronized sequence. We had uh, the uh, broad explanation from Francis Pellacur, the launch operations manager in his bunker. His heartbeat, no doubt, has gone down again. Or maybe going up as we're getting back into the six minutes. Uh, so in these six minutes we have uh, two computers uh, which are during the preparation used one for the electrical systems and the other for the fluids 
and during the six minutes, due to the amount of data and checks to be done, they're working parallel. The sequence is automatic. Nobody is pushing buttons or so on. This is the computers doing all the work and are progressively putting the launcher into uh, flight configuration. And there are things like arming. We're going to release the inertia platforms, which we do just nine seconds before, and also giving the commands to release the cryogenic arms. One of the things that will happen as well is what we call the pressurization of the third stage tanks. Th that is correct. We are uh, in this last uh, sequence pressurizing the uh, third stage tank to flight level and uh, that is used for one hand to uh, stiffen up the third stage but also the pressure used to, to drive the fluids into the turbo pump for during the propulsion phase which is going to occur uh, a bit later when we're high up in the trajectory. When is the flight program actually introduced into the main computer of the launcher? That is done in the last hour. Uh, if uh, Oh, we looked at it beforehand, but it's uh, between one an hour and half an hour before launch. And to come back to the satellite, is that autonomous at this stage? The satellite is being controlled, but it's being controlled manually. And uh, the uh, going over to internal power, which they should have done by now, uh, is being done manually. One of the things that our launch operations manager, Francis Pellecker, mentioned was that we have a, a, an ignition sequence in two stages. First, the first stage, its Viking engines will be ignited, and then the propellant, the uh, boosters. That is correct. We use approximately four seconds of uh, engine performance to verify in two scanning sequences that all the pressures, temperatures are correct in the four Viking engines. And uh, uh, when that is correct, the uh, order is given to release the clamps, which is holding the launcher to the ground, and the ignition right after of the two boosters. And we have liftoff. It's, uh, then we will have liftoff, as was said, at uh, four seconds, four seconds after the ignition of the first stage. Yes. T0 t plus, plus four, four seconds. seconds yes. right. Something between four and four, 4 4.2 and 4.8 seconds. We saw those cryotechnic arms. Those will fall back away from the launcher uh, very shortly before liftoff. Uh, five seconds before. Five seconds. Everything is proceeding normally. We're two minutes and uh, practically 10 seconds away. Yeah, and we are now flight pressurized as we said beforehand, just happened. The Echo Star team there, Mr. Zhang, Michele Franchi from Ariane Space, the payload manager, Rohan Zaveri, and you can see Francis Avance in the background. These are the ultimate moments where we're used to this kind of situation in Kuru. We're the ninth flight this year, but there's always a certain uh, feeling of anticipation, kind of excitement, latent, certain tension perhaps, and excitement particularly for our guests who are seeing it for the very first time. Our DDO, our launch range manager, Julio Montréal, will be announcing the one minute mark in 20 seconds time. A tous les DDO, attention pour moins une minute. Top, moins une minute. The launcher is on onboard power. Right, the very last seconds. If you've just tuned in, you're better late than never, but you're in time to see Ariane Flight V91 lift off from Kourou in French Guiana. Our precious payload, Echo Star 2, the second satellite for the Echo Star Corporation, is going up to rejoin its brother in orbit. Start of first stage servo motors. Let's sit back and appreciate the spectacle. We'll be back once we're off the ground. Launchers armed. This, 9, 
8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, top Our camera is situated here in Kourou, clearly seeing the ascension of our 42P. And everything is normal on board. All parameters good. The uh, solid propellant boosters will be jettisoned after a short while. Here's a shot uh, seen by the infrared camera that is situated on Devil's Island, some 15 kilometers off the coast. Parameters de propulsion normal. We can hear inside our commentary booth the launcher as it arcs over. And it starts heading east. Separation de deux propulsions d'appoint. Separation of the propulsion, the solid propellant boosters. Le pilotage est normal. And you notice that it's also, uh, a minute between the end of the uh, propulsion of the solid boosters and the uh, separation, and that is to get them to fall away from the launch pad, not to damage the buildings. Right, we have superimposed on our screen not only the picture of the launcher rise, rising, seen as through uh, an infrared camera, there an optical camera, in fact. Uh, we have the curve, the nominal curve, and the actual position of our launcher, and the corresponding figures on the right-hand side, Sunni. Yes, and on the right-hand side at the top is the elapsed time. It's now 137 seconds. We are using uh, the Breton 1 uh, radar to track the launcher. The SEC Athibus on the, which you, uh, the radar is seeing it. Uh, we have an altitude of 33 kilometers already and we have reached 0.9 kilometers per second. And uh, seen from the Devil's Island, we can see the launcher really arcing out to go out over the Atlantic eastwards. Altitude already 41 kilometers, 42, our velocity 1.2 kilometers a second. And you can see from the picture that uh, the launcher has now reached uh, much thinner air in that the plume has grown outwards from the four Viking engines. And this first stage is consuming its storable propellants at the rate of one ton a second. Uh, to be precise, 220 tons consumed in the 3 minutes and 20 seconds that it'll burn. Tous les paramètres à bord sont normaux, la trajectoire est normale. And uh, the uh, trajectory parameters and flight parameters are normal. premier étage. Right, the uh, burnout of the first stage. Separation 1, 2. Separation between the first and second stage. Allumage, deuxième étage. Ignition of the second stage. Parameters de propulsion normal. Everything is normal, says our launch range manager. And uh, the next stage in the uh, port, uh, important point is the separation of the fairing. We are carrying the, Tous les paramètres sont uh, the fairing up uh, oh, until oh. the uh, air is sufficiently thin not to get thermal heating in excess of what uh, the satellite can carry. And our cameras on Devil's Island can still see the launcher, that little dot uh, below the, uh, the curve. It's a very clear sky. Our altitude there, 100 kilometers. All parameters good. And 2.8 kilometer per second, which is approximately a little bit less than a third of the final speed we need to reach. Coming up to the jettisoning of the fairing, the protective cover over our passenger. Separation coiffe. And there it was, separation of the fairing. We economize, we lighten our launcher by some uh, 100 kilograms. By 700 kilograms, actually. Easier to... Tous les paramètres sont normaux. All parameters good. We do, for some of the flights, actually, uh, 
throw of the fairing away a bit lower to gain some additional performance on the launcher. Velocity already 3.6 kilometers a second, altitude 134 kilometers. And on the ground track you can see that we start flying directly east out of uh, uh, the coast. Uh, the to protect uh, the Kourou area in case of any accident, so it's for safety reasons. And uh, we have no turn into the 7 degree inclination uh, which we are launching normally. Coming up to the separation of the second and third stage, 160 kilometers high. Fin de propulsion du deuxième étage. That's the end of uh, propulsion of the second stage. Separation. Allumage troisième étage. Ignition of the third stage. This is our cryogenic uh, stage. All parameters good. Third stage ignition. And Julio Montréal actually giving us the details in English. Thank you, Julio. Tous les paramètres sont normaux. All the parameters are normal. Now this uh, third stage, Sunny, is going to function for some 13 minutes, practically 13 minutes. Yeah, it's a long period of time when you're waiting for it. It's the, uh, the blockbuster, could we say, of this launcher. Yes. Which is going to increase our velocity from uh, 4 kilometers a second to what, is, what are we uh, aiming to at? 9.5 kilometers a second to get into the geostationary transfer orbit. Uh, Vehicle is being tracked, we should uh, explain, by different means, downrange stations. Uh, we're using in the initial phase in the visibility from uh, Kourou, uh, the uh, radar, the Bretagne radar, which is shown here, which is following the track. In parallel, we have two uh, gyros on board, uh, gyro centrals, and uh, one of them is in parallel via telemetry giving us similar data and on the screen in front of the, the uh, operational crew here both of these uh, uh, plots are being shown and they are exactly conforming in the same way we have our tracking stations giving us continuous uh, coverage of the position of our launcher receiving its telemetry the station stations are overlapping in their zone they have to be we need uh, visibility of the launcher over the whole trajectory to ensure that it's following its path. Tous les paramètres à bord sont normaux. Altitude 246 km. 246 km, velocity 5.5 uh, km a second. Now, people often ask why is that curve rising and then we see on the right hand side that it seems to be uh, leveling out and in fact later on we'll see that it dips. The totality of the third stage launch trajectory is optimized with respect to the mass of the what's left, the third stage and the and the payload. We're starting out with about 17 tons of uh, 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 mass, and at that time the engine is functioning with the same thrust at, uh, the whole time. And uh, as we're burning so long time, we'll also have a, a, a loss of mass of about 10 tons which means that in the beginning we have to push a very high mass and we can't keep the acceleration up so we are uh, slowly losing a bit in acceleration not reaching uh, the height more than about 250 to 300 kilometers and then we're going to use the attraction of the earth to continue the acceleration up to the in orbit velocity if I could make the comparison, it's rather like a big dipper. We go up the slope and then we go down much, much faster. Yeah, it's a roller coaster. And back up again. Yes, and back up again. Right. And, and like a roller coaster, you can see at the end of the trajectory that when the third stage has stopped it, its propulsion, the speed will go down, which is totally normal. We're 562 seconds into flight, already 5.5 kilometers a second. We're aiming at that 9.7, approximately, 274 kilometers altitude. You can also see that, uh, oh, it changed over from uh, the means we're using is now uh, the station at Natal. Tous les paramètres à normal. Brazil. In Brazil, and just before that we just had the Athibus and what it was looking with down to two degrees. 
So we're switching over now. We have, we'll see the atoms moving up. Mr. Ergen recording this uh, experience for his uh, personal archives. No doubt it's uh, an immense satisfaction for him. Preparing this flight, we were able to uh, meet Mr. Ergen and uh, read a lot about him. Uh, Mr. Ergen, who started back in uh, the early 80s, uh, selling those big dishes, those C-band dishes that are in meters three meters wide this was the way one received television signals from uh, satellites at the time and now he's come full circle from these big dishes that cost uh, ten thousand dollars or so back in the early 80s he's now selling very small dishes that one call pizza dishes for under two hundred dollars and he's selling these dishes to receive the programs of his very own satellites so it's a remarkable uh, feat Yes, o on the other hand, if you look here in the crew area, you can still see this big C-band dishes as various areas. I wonder if there are any uh, dishes manufactured and sold by Mr. Ergen here in Kuru. We'll ask him, I think, later. Mr. Ergen's colleagues, who we have been able to talk to as well, uh, mentioned the vision that this man has uh, of being able to uh, carry out his projects and see many years ahead and to implement them. And... Uh, this made me think of other people, and perhaps in the same mold, perhaps different personalities, people like uh, Steve Jobs of Apple or Bill Gates of Microsoft, uh, people who are willing to take risks and uh, who get results, and who do this, uh, in this case, uh, with uh, a very good surrounding of a family affair. Faithful colleagues like uh, James DeFranco, who helped found his company in the early 80s. He's here, isn't he? Yes. And his wife, Candy. Uh, talking about pioneers, we mentioned uh, visionaires, and I always think of Mr. Arthur C. Clarke back in uh, the early 40s, who imagined the use that one could make of this geostationary orbit, 36,000 kilometers up, 22,000 miles above our heads and the immense use that has been made by telecommunications satellites since then. These birds that are parked in a relatively stationary position relative to Earth. Everything is normal, propulsion, says our launch range manager. And we're uh, still continuing to increasing the speed. Back to our craft, Echo Star 2, the second in the series. It'll have an in-orbit mass of some 1,730 kilograms. For a rough idea, that's about the size of a small European car. And you mentioned beforehand that the, the liftoff mass is 2,865. So they're themselves going to use quite a lot of the propellant to get up into their circular orbit. And once it is in its final orbit, it'll have fuel allowing it uh, an orbital maneuvering life of 15 years, and that will give it uh, an operational minimum of at least 12 years. There are solar wings aboard this satellite as well. They'll provide some seven kilowatts of power to the transponder payload. There are 16 KU band channels, 130 watts, with a power amplifier redundancy, two groups of 12 or 8 for operational safety and security. And our birds, of course, have their antennae. Each satellite has one to receive the signals from Cheyenne, the uplink facility, and two reflectors to beam the DISH network back down to the United States. Throughout the operational life, the Echo Star 1 and 2 satellites have a remarkable ability to stay in the same place. It's indispensable and also pointing in the same earthwards direction. It's what we call station keeping accuracy. That's to within plus or minus, I, I believe, 0 0.05 degrees. Yes, and that's an orbital box of between 70 and 30 kilometers. And uh, you know what's really uh, the propellant is used for is to keep the satellite in this box. Uh, the most costly part is taking care of the the tide effect from the sun and the moon. Our uh, performance is entirely nominal. Nominal. 
And you can see now we are out of uh, the uh, Natal station. We have no more radar tracking us. Now we have the uh, secondary gyro following the uh, uh, launch trajectory and giving us the data. Seeing Mr. Francis Avanzi there of Ariane Space makes me think uh, that we should give a bit of Ariane Space news and instead of talking as we usually do about the latest contracts, uh, an interesting story about Ariane Space in an opinion poll that was published at the end of August in France where several companies came came out top of a league table and we had Microsoft uh, number one everything's normal we had Danone the food group number two and the cosmetics firm L'Oréal and Ariane Space yes was fourth in this general league table it was an opinion poll where 1700 top managers and executives in France they were polled on their opinion of the country's 220 leading top firms Ariane Space then came out fourth in this opinion poll. It was first in the aeronautical category and uh, Matra Marconi Space incidentally which makes the vehicle equipment bay for Ariane was second in this category and third was the European Airbus Consortium. Another interesting thing was amongst the criteria used to classify all these companies according to the big bosses uh, criteria such as company financial results, manpower management, public relations. Ariane Space swept the board on the criteria of quality of product and quality of service. No, no doubt no. everybody, yourself included, certainly was very pleased on that. Oh, that is correct. That was an opinion poll in the magazine, the business uh, magazine called L'Expansion. But uh, it's also uh, a venture, an adventure that involves not just French firms and no, it's European a, firms. it's a totally European activity, uh, and uh, you see part of it here. You're working for Ariane Space tonight, you're British French, I'm Swede, so that's also a picture of what Ariane Space is, a European company with uh, uh, most of the European companies participating in bigger or less degree to this venture. Right, let's check the curve now. Everything is normal. Uh, we have uh, coverage of our satellite uh, by uh, which tracking station, Sunny, at the moment? It is, uh, we're out uh, for ascension for the time being, almost in the middle. Over the Atlantic. And uh, we will soon be picked up by Libreville as the next uh, tracking station. And we're already, you see, at a velocity of 9.1 kilometers a second. And we've seen we've flattened out the curve, and we're we've reached, uh, and are passing through our parity level. And we have something to burn for. Uh, it's uh, one more minute uh, to propulsion for the end of the third state flight. We've been talking so much; it's gone very fast. It always okay. goes very, very fast, and to everybody's great satisfaction, Mr. Ergen explaining things in more detail to his enough. child. We'll wait for the announcement of the end All of uh, All parameters good. the functioning of this third stage. We don't have burnout here. We have uh, we actually shut, shut shut down the engine. We do. We uh, leave some uh, propellant left in the tank, so in the order of about 150 to 200 kilograms, to ensure that we have a smooth shut down the third stage. Yes. Shut third down. stage and propulsion and 9.7 kilometers per second, so we're there. And it's, there incor it's incorrect when I say we shut down. In fact, it's the launcher's own flight program that shuts down the yeah, engine when it has reached the uh, required uh, velocity. Yeah. And, uh, it's position. actually the, the flight program and the Swedish Right, what happens now between uh, the shutdown of the third stage and the release of Echo Star? We've been flying in the same way to give us a good tra trajectory. The onboard computer has told the third stage where to go. Uh, now we have to work on the needs of the satellite. The satellite's got to be pointed in a, a specific direction. It's got to have stability, so we're going to spin it up. And after we spun it up, we're going to separate the satellite from the launcher. We're going to move the launcher around a bit, point it in another direction, spin it up again, 
and move it away a bit from the uh, satellite so during the orbit they will not come in contact again. I think they lived together sufficiently not to meet again. How, how is the satellite in fact attached and to the problem of Earth? It's uh, called a clamp band, so you have a steel band of which has V-formed shoes which is clamping the flanges of the adapter and uh, the satellite band. And that is then released by a pyrotechnic bolt. There's a uh, knife cutting the bolt in two and it releases the satellite. So the springs propel the satellite forward to separate uh, it and, from And after that the normal. physical separation is done by springs. All, the, good. all these very complicated maneuvers of orientation, separation of Echo Star 2, there we have... Jubilation all round is quite natural, much awaited moment, the culmination of years of work for the Echo Star team. Handshakes all round. Let's recall that Echo Star has been separated from the launcher and uh, Echo Star is starting its life in orbit but it's in a transfer orbit and it will have to reach that final destination uh, on the geostationary orbit it has and uh, we'll have to wait a while uh, we know that we've left it in the right orbit but it will take up to uh, another uh, 20 25 minutes before it's seen by the station in guam where it's picked up for the first time there are two stations that will ensure this, uh, what we call the early orbit phases, the uh, positioning of the satellite in its uh, final position, 119 degrees west. Two stations, one uh, in uh, Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania, I believe, it's called the Alpha Station, Tracking Station, and the Guam Station that you mentioned, and this is uh, all part of the facilities of uh, Lockheed Martin. And also, during the... Uh, Four, three, two, one, stop. We pay of our launch. Magnificent sight seen from the uh, camera on the uh, Ariane assembly building, a kilometer from the uh, pad. There's Mr. Erwin Muller, satisfied. He must have seen quite a few satellites launched into orbit over the years. But their work is not finished yet. They are waiting here for the acquisition, and, the, and after that, as you said, the uh, Lockheed Martin uh, ground facilities will take over, and they have. Uh, work to do over the next uh, weeks and months. Mr. Muller congratulating his team there, Mr. Zhang, Mr. Zaveri and Mr. Vansi in the background, your colleague Frankie, uh, Michele Franchi. And for the next activities on Merci the satellite we can talk while we're waiting for these guys to congratulate. Uh, each other uh, that will have Apogee boost motor firings on the second, fifth and seventh Apogees and that will start approximately 15 hours from now. Uh, and uh, in five days there will be transfer orbit operations before we deploy the solar panels and the deployment of the antennas. Now, during this, uh, here's another replay.
The satellite during these few days until it gets to its final position, uh, does it live off its internal batteries? Does it have some sort of electrical power from its solar panels? If the solar panels are folded and the uh, outermost of the four uh, panels in each wing uh, during the rotation of the satellite is seeing the sun sufficiently to uh, give a, a positive power budget or power situation at the end of that. Here's another replay, I believe, that our director is going to give us. The liftoff as seen from uh, the technical center zone, 15 kilometers away. There she is rising. Looks small in the distance, doesn't it? But it's a very interesting shot. I've never seen it seen from yeah. this angle. I think we've been very fortunate in having a quite clear sky for this liftoff, giving us an opportunity to see the launcher rise and fly up. Here's Mr. Francis of Anzi then for the afterflight speech. So late. Marche Some hesitation from uh, Mr. Vanzi. One can get the launcher up, but the microphone may not be perfectly responding as we would like it. This one is okay. Thanks. So, ladies and gentlemen, dear Iron friends, as you saw it live, our Iron 4 once again delivered and achieve its mission for Flight uh, 91. The spacecraft... Thank you. The spacecraft EcoStar is now on its GTO orbit, ready for the next step for a final orbital position at uh, 119 degrees west, which means covering uh, the continental United States of America. The flight has been, uh, I can say, smooth and accurate, it is our ninth flight of 96, and the 13 satellites placed into orbit out of a total of 114 launched by Anna Space. This has also been the 20th launch in 19 months, confirming what we like to call the Ariane regular line transportation lane to space. In a couple of days, the Ariane 5 recovery plan will be ready for implementation and 97 will see the new vehicle of the 21st century flying for the best profit of all our customers. My thoughts now go to our customers, EcoStar, whose whole team and family has been very well focused on this event, which represents the second satellite on orbit in their fleet of EcoStar. EcoStar and I in space have a lot of things in common. Both are pioneers, and represent the successful and love story of a family. EcoStar represents for me the typical American way of dealing with business, with risk taking and value providing to the customers. And it's great. And I really want to salute the talent of the EcoStar team in this way. Tonight among us we have the, the co-founders of the company, Jim DeFranco, as well as Charlie Jurgen and his wife Candy. Along five kids, as well as most of the members of EcoStar management team, also with some of their kids. And this love story started for EcoStar in 1980, same year for INS Space, with the company principally engaged in the manufacturing and the selling of uh, te telecommunication equipment. Today EcoStar has become a major player in the United States for direct TV, at least one of the, uh, the first one in low cost and the best value for the customers. 
Last April, we signed together a launch service contract with an IAN launch five months later. Thus, we are very proud that you gave us the opportunity of such a challenge and that we succeeded to offering you and your customers the continuity of service that you expected and in achieving the record of a five monthly time to order. But keep it as an exception, it's not our intent to do it again. On behalf of uh, IAN Space, the whole team and all the members of IAN community acting here as well as in Europe, in Washington, in Tokyo, I want to thank you for your confidence and to warmly congratulate you and to wish you the best in your operations. And I'm sure that uh, uh, your whole trip from Denver to Kourou will be uh, an unforgettable event for all of you. And you know that sometimes it's easier to go to space with Ayan than to come from uh, Denver to Kourou. I also want to to take this opportunity to thank you, our friends from Lockheed Martin Astro System, along with EcoStar for the outstanding teamwork with Ion Space and the CSG, the preparation of this campaign. And now I would like to ask uh, Charlie Jürgen to join me. You know, I've, I've watched these, I think for the 91st flight, I think I've watched the first 90 on television, or 89, I mean, one of them I watched here, and the CEO always gets up afterward and pretty calmly thanks everybody, but I'm not calm. My guts were getting ripped out well, for about 21 minutes, uh, and it was very, very exciting, and we thank uh, Arion Space very much. Obviously, uh, we did set a record. We, we signed the contract April 29th, I think, and, and with the help of Lockheed Martin, uh, AT&T Skynet Division, we were able to integrate the satellite and, and get it up successfully. So. Uh, I think that uh, that's a very difficult thing to do, and uh, certainly launching satellites, as we've come to learn about, it's a very difficult thing to do, and Arion makes it look easy, and we're very, very thankful that, that you let us uh, 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 join with you and, and go up, and we look forward to maybe doing it again sometime. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Terry Hart and his staff, Erwin and John, who, who integrated with us down here, uh, and uh, the Lockheed Martin team, Dave Bear and his people. Uh, did a great job, and, and now the, we hand it over to Lockheed Martin here for the next couple weeks to, to get us on orbit. Um, we certainly like to thank the, uh, our investors who have shown confidence in us, and we're not the easiest story in the world to understand, but, uh, and the FCC for giving a little company a chance to, to go compete against some pretty big companies with the licenses that we have uh, so that we can do that. But most of all, I think I'd like to thank you know, the employees of EchoStar. Uh, I'm always very uh, humbled. Uh, at this event, and uh, it's because you guys have, have made it possible, and uh, that's tough for me to uh, to not be in Denver, and, and I wish everybody could be here. Uh, it was great to have my family here, but it, it's also, uh, you know, tough not to be up there, and I hope that uh, all of you are having a good time out there. You know, I, I was camping with my son this weekend, and, and I looked up, and, 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 and there was a, we looked at the stars, and, and I knew one of them was an Echo Star. And uh, that one was stationary, and uh, now there's one that's, that's uh, rotating around a little bit as it circles the globe every 90 minutes, but in a couple of weeks that one will be stationary too, and uh, I think with your guys' help we'll, we'll put a constellation of them up there. Uh, it's not, in the, in the direct-to-home business, it's not going to be the company that makes the most cars or, or has the biggest phone company or the biggest cable company that, that, that's successful. It's, it's going to be the company that takes care of its customer and and launches the most satellites. And we plan on launching the most satellites. So look forward to seeing you guys on Thursday. Th thank you, Charlie. We are, we are ready to do it again for you. And uh, <clears throat> I just would like to uh, uh, give many thanks to all of you for uh, coming here and uh, for supporting us. Also many thanks to the whole team of EcoStar. Uh, who was be behind us uh, in Denver. Long life to EchoStar 2, and uh, next rendezvous uh, for us will be uh, for Flight 92, uh, the 7th of November, with two satellites on board, Arabsat 2B and Miasat 2 from Malaysia, uh, on board of uh, Nayan 4 again. Thank you. There the traditional after-flight speeches by our customer and by Francis Avanzi.
our customer, Charlie Ergen, emotional, and one can then understand the satisfaction of seeing another replay of this launch. Right, we come back now to the uh, close of our show. Mr. Vanzi mentioned the next Ariane launch on the 7th of November, and it's about that time that Echo Star 2 will be coming to its final position and perhaps um, becoming operational. That is correct, and uh, it's a short but intense time for the Echo Star team to get there. And the great satisfaction for Mr. Ergen and for Ariane Space being able to help, it, help each other out in such a short time, over four months, between the contract, signature, and the launch of the day. That is a record. Ariane Space will be back uh, on its transportation line then at the beginning of November with Arabsat and Miasat. Thank you, Sunni, for your contribution. I, for one, have certainly learned a lot. I believe that after eight years here, you're moving on. So from Simon, Joshua, Paul Chatko and myself, we wish you well for the future. Thanks a lot, and I hope we'll see you again somewhere at some of these events. And goodbye to everyone from French Guiana and Kourou. Bye-bye.